Over on Jaguar Gatorade, a new college football video is out. In this video, we talk about a 1989 controversy between the Ivy League and ESPN, and how ESPN wanted the Ivy League to get more TV exposure, but did it by insulting the Ivy League in the process. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch. And now, on with our feature presentation. February 6, 2011. Super Bowl 45 down in Arlington, Texas, between the Green Bay Packers and the Pittsburgh Steelers. While the game itself was good, everything off the field about this game was an absolute train wreck, to the point where many argue, and rightfully so, that it was the worst, most poorly planned Super Bowl of all time. And no incident highlighted that more than the infamous, controversial seat fiasco that took place. In an effort to boost capacity and break the record set at Super Bowl 14, the Cowboys installed temporary seats into Cowboys Stadium, and they sold those seats off. The only problem? The seats were not completed in time for the game, which left 1,250 people without a seat. While the NFL was able to relocate 850 of those people elsewhere in the stadium, 400 people who thought they were going to be watching the game on the field were instead watching it on a TV screen. It was a giant fiasco that may have single-handedly cost Dallas a shot at hosting another Super Bowl, and in every sense of the word, it was a disaster. Why do I bring this up? Because while you probably know about that story, because of how recent it was, and because it took place at the Super Bowl, so the stakes were higher, you might not know about this one involving the Cincinnati Bengals. Because more than 40 years before, the Bengals played their first game at their brand new home, Riverfront Stadium, playing a preseason game against Washington. And it was an absolute disaster, because as it turns out, the Bengals sold tickets to this game that did not exist because the seats were not ready in time. You would think this would be the kind of thing in the history of the NFL that wouldn't happen twice, but we're taking a deep dive into this forgotten incident. Because in the over three decade long history of Riverfront Stadium, this is the story behind the biggest disaster and ticketing fiasco in the stadium's history. Before I talk about the actual incident in question, we need some context to talk about how the stadium was being used before the Bengals were set to play their first game there. I would say we need some context to talk about the game, but come on. It's a preseason game. There is no context and nothing important to talk about with that. But with the stadium itself? Oh boy, there is a lot. For the first two seasons that the Bengals were a team in the American Football League, they played their games at Nippert Stadium on the campus of the University of Cincinnati. However, it was clear that this was just a temporary option until they could move into a home of their own. Nipper held less than 30,000 people, and per the rules of the merger, by 1970, every team had to play in a stadium with a capacity of at least 50,000. The Bengals were going to move into the brand new Riverfront Stadium for the 1970 season, and would now have the ability to draw crowds in the 50,000s. Heck, this preseason game that's the subject of our story wound up drawing 52,299, which at the time, was the largest crowd not just in Bengals history, but in Cincinnati sports history. That being said, it was clear that there were issues right away with this deal, as the Bengals were not the primary tenant of the stadium. They were the second fiddle to the baseball team, the Cincinnati Reds. This was right around the time that cities were starting to build multi-purpose, cookie-cutter stadiums, and the Reds and Bengals would both be sharing Riverfront Stadium. Problems arose before the stadium even opened with the Reds, as the primary tenant insisted on painting the AstroTurf infield brown to look like dirt. The Bengals wanted a completely green field, with white stripes outlining the dirt infield area. However, the Reds prevailed on this debate, with a spokesman for the Reds saying, the surface has to be painted like a baseball field. That means what it says, and the Reds will insist the infield area will be painted brown. Alright, so we're not exactly off to the best of starts, especially since you would think this dispute would be settled well before two weeks before the stadium was set to open for the Reds, but that's trivial compared to the main issue. Because when you have a multi-purpose stadium, oftentimes, the seating configurations are not the same for football and baseball. It rarely works out that way. You'll have to move some seats around to make it work, especially since stadiums hold more for football than they do for baseball. Perhaps the most obvious example of stadiums having different configurations for different sports is with Candlestick Park which housed the San Francisco 49ers and the San Francisco Giants. Look at this aerial shot of Candlestick Park. See those bleachers that look like they're hanging over the field? Obviously, 
the stadium doesn't look like that for baseball, unless you want right field being 150 feet from home plate, bringing a whole new definition to the short porch. Those are only there for football. However, if you ever notice those empty seats on an angle that no one sits in, even for playoff games, those obstructed seats are only there for baseball, as those are the seats down the first baseline. While it wasn't as obvious to the untrained eye to figure out the configuration for Riverfront Stadium, it was a similar situation where there had to be seating configuration changes made between football and baseball. On the afternoon of Sunday, August 2nd, 1970, the Cincinnati Reds defeated the Chicago Cubs 4-3 in 11 innings on a single by Bobby Tolan to center field, which brought Ty Klein in to score. On the night of Saturday, August 8th, the Cincinnati Bengals were set to play their first preseason game of the year, and the first ever football contest at Riverfront Stadium. This meant that the crew had six days to change the venue from a baseball configuration to a football configuration. That seems like a cakewalk. We've seen teams change stadiums from baseball to football in less than a day. Heck, what you're watching right now is something from 2013, where the Oakland Coliseum changed from a baseball configuration to a football configuration in just one overnight shift. And you can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Granted, it was the first time that Riverfront Stadium was making this change, so it wasn't going to be entirely smooth sailing. But to have nearly a full week to do this? No problem whatsoever. Everything was good to go, especially after city officials started the preparations for the switchover the moment that the Reds game ended on Sunday. So who is going to be the one responsible for changing the field, and to erect and dismantle the outfield fence and sections of the stands? Well, that's where we get into a sticky situation. The firm responsible for this was Huber, Hunt, and Nichols, as that firm was the general contractor for the stadium. It's a firm that is still around today, albeit under the name Hunt Construction Group, and was responsible for current NFL venues like Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis, State Farm Stadium in Glendale, and SoFi Stadium in Inglewood. As part of the conversion, the outfield fence would be taken down, and movable seats would be rolled out onto the field by the sidelines. Now what employees would this firm get to do the conversion, and would get to take down the outfield fence? At first, it was going to be the Carpenters who were going to do it. No, not Karen and Richard. Two people can't do this job by themselves, and I'm fairly certain they had better things to do in 1970. I mean actual carpenters. The carpenters were going to be the ones responsible for all of this. However, the iron workers also thought that they were going to be the ones responsible for this. Again, considering we knew about the multi-purpose nature of the stadium for years, and knew that transformations between baseball and football were going to happen quite frequently, you would think this dispute would have been settled well in advance, and not the week that it was going to happen. But now, you have the Ironworker Union in a direct conflict with the Carpenter Union. Both Carpenters and Ironworkers believe that they had the right to do the transformation. And on Monday, August 3rd, the Carpenters, all 60 of them, protested by walking off the job and by going on strike. Oddly enough, it was a rainy day. So I guess you could say that rainy days and Mondays were getting Cincy down. And at this point, the conversion was in serious jeopardy, that Francis Cornelius, the principal engineer for the city, said that the walkout is hurting us very seriously, and said that even if the walkout ended on Tuesday and everything was resolved, that because of how much time was lost, that getting the stadium ready for Saturday's game was going to be a stretch, and that it might not be completed. Now, the good news for Riverfront Stadium and for the Bengals was that the next day, on Tuesday, August 4th, a district court judge by the name of Timothy S. Hogan ordered the Carpenters to return to their jobs. Time was of the essence, and while the dispute could be settled later, right now, it was time to put differences aside to get this done, because more than 50,000 people were depending on it. The bad news was that despite the temporary restraining order that ordered the Carpenters to get back to work on dismantling the outfield fence, the Carpenters still did not show up to work as for the second straight day, the outfield fence was still up. Apparently, you can just refuse a court order and not show up to work. Bold strategy, Cotton. Unsurprisingly, it did not pay off for them. Because after the Carpenters refused to show up for work on Tuesday despite court orders, Huber, Hunt, and Nichols let them know in no uncertain terms that if they refused to honor the court order, and if they refused to get back to work, that they would be fired from their jobs. And that was enough of a threat 
to get the Carpenters back on the job, and was enough to get the Carpenters to work on the transformation again, setting aside their differences for the moment with the iron workers. However, even though everything was back on track, and all the workers were back at their stations to get the stadium ready for Saturday night, they were still two days behind schedule. As the Carpenters said, we've only just begun, it's going to take some time. And considering the fact that this was the first time that they were ever doing this conversion, those two days were absolutely critical. They were running on borrowed time, and the chances that Riverfront Stadium would be ready for this game were slim. Still, city officials assured people that there was no reason to panic, and that the stadium would be ready for this opening game, as though nothing had even happened. Heck, according to Wallace Power, the city utilities director, they even hired additional workers to speed up the process and make up for lost time. Side note, a utilities director having the last name of Power is so fitting and so apt that it might be one of the best last names I've ever heard that matches with a job description. However, as hard as they tried, and as much as they pushed to get the stadium ready for the game, judging by the title of this video, I think you can tell whether they succeeded or not. Because the stadium was not ready for this game whatsoever. The Bengals won this preseason game 27-12, so that's the good news for the team. But the bad news was that there were nine whole sections of movable seats that were not completed. This meant that if you had a ticket in one of those nine sections, each of which held 40 people, then you were straight out of luck. You had a ticket to the game? Too bad, you don't have a seat. In total, 360 people were left without a seat that they paid money for. That's 360 people who decided instead of just staying at home and relaxing after a long week of work and listening to a game on the radio, or instead of hitting up the town, to go to the game and brave the wet weather conditions, only for them to be told that they couldn't make it in. And the crazy part? The city tried to spin this as a win. I'm sorry, what? You had one job! Get the stadium ready for the game! You failed at that job! And you're trying to spin this as a win? As though this was a good thing? People got screwed over because of your incompetence, and you're celebrating? The writers of the Cincinnati Inquirer who wrote about this used language like, just 360 seats short, instead of saying 360 seats short, with the word just implying that it was so close to being done. They also said only nine sections instead of nine sections, with the word only implying that it wasn't a big deal, and impacted no one in particular, even though we know that this was a lie. Ralph Bardoff, who worked on the transformation, said, These boys have worked awful hard to get this thing ready. How can you say that? When A, you weren't having people work overnight, and you only had construction going on 12 hours during the day, when you easily could have gotten an overnight crew to speed it up. B, this process took a week, when according to city officials, when everything is optimized, the process is supposed to take 24 to 36 hours. And C, when you literally took two days off, because of a dispute that should have been relatively easy to solve over the past two years and disobeyed a court order to do it. Just absolute incompetence on the part of everyone involved. So today, if you go to a Bengals game at Paul Brown Stadium, I guess the lesson here is to be extremely grateful that you have a seat and that your assigned seat is actually there. Because for some unlucky fans of the team more than half a century ago, this was not the case. Riverfront Stadium had a fantastic opportunity with this game to be on top of the world and to make a great first impression as the new home of the Cincinnati Bengals. Instead, they did anything but that. Because after a dispute involving city officials, iron workers, and carpenters, all that the carpenters and everyone involved were doing was hurting each other. Each other and the 360 fans that they screwed over in the process. Get your official Jaguar Gator 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar Gator 9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.